Welcome to Care Coordination and Interoperable Health IT Systems, ensuring the security and privacy of information shared. This is Lecture C, Data Provenance. The objectives for this unit, ensuring the security and privacy of information shared, Lecture C, are to review interoperable systems for weaknesses in structure or processes which may result in a loss of trust. Discuss the need for data provenance and analyze the system specifications and functionality to establish data provenance. So before we get down to the basics of data provenance, let's talk a little bit about what the threats are when using an interoperable system. One of the first threats are unencrypted networks and devices. So if you remember from Lecture B, we talked about needing encryption at all points when you are using protected health information. One of the largest threats remains untrained users, both consumers and healthcare workers. This could be when devices are used inappropriately, or it could also be something as simple as phishing via email, where you get a false email that asks you to click and log in thereby stealing your username and password. There are hackers, and we've seen now where hospitals have had their data held for a ransom until the hospital paid millions of dollars. And of course, stealing identities, healthcare identities, your insurance information, your social security number, and other relevant data are worth a tremendous amount on the black market and we don't know what will come next. What will be the next threat that we would have to deal with in an electronic world and system? There are 10 top steps for cybersecurity. Any technical details that we would have provided to you during this lecture would have been outdated within six months of us recording this lecture. So in these next two slides, we really attempt to talk about the more human aspects of cybersecurity, because that's still where we see the greatest threat, is from people acting inappropriately or taking actions that put the protected health information at threat. The first is to establish a security culture from the very highest levels of the organization to the lowest levels. Everyone needs to be focused on ensuring that protected health information remains secure. The second one is to protect mobile devices. Laptops need to be encrypted. Flash drives need to be encrypted. Smartphones need to be encrypted. You also need to have remote monitoring and the ability to remotely wipe a device should it be compromised. Everyone needs to maintain good computer habits. This can be locking mobile devices to desks or other furniture. It can also be as simple as logging off anytime you walk away from a monitor or closing an office door behind you so that it locks and all of the other electronic equipment within that office is then secure. Obviously, for networks, you should use a firewall so that there is some electronic protection and install and maintain antivirus software. This may sound very basic, but it's not unknown for people to let their antivirus software lapse, thinking, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I'll get to it next week. Antivirus software these days is updating almost daily. You also need to plan for the unexpected. This includes creating data backups regularly and reliably. That means also testing those data backups to make sure your data is actually backed up and you can get to it should you need it. Begin backing up the data from the first day you use a new system. Ensure the data is being captured correctly. Review it, make sure there are no errors, and use an automated backup system if possible. Don't leave it to human memory. Consider storing the backup far away from the main system. So if you're on the Gulf Coast of the United States, your backup data should be stored in some form further away from the Gulf Coast should a hurricane hit, so you can get to your backup data. 
protect the backup media with the same types of access controls that you use for access to your system. Know your recovery plan. What data is backed up? When were the backups done? Where are the backups stored? What types of equipment do we need to restore them? So you can see this is involved. You also need to control access to protected health information. People need to have a reason to access PHI and you need to have policies and procedures around that. And you need to have people who are in charge of providing access to the PHI. Use strong passwords and change them regularly. The standard is 90 days and the standard is now eight characters or more, a mixture of numbers, letters, and special characters. Use strong passwords and then have the clients change them regularly. Obviously, limit network access. Not everyone can have access to the data. Limit access so not everyone gets to access your secure network. Most facilities now have a secure network to run their operations on, and they have a guest network that is unsecured for people to use at their own risk. Don't allow everyone access to your secure network. Control physical access to data using measures such as card keys or biometrics, locked rooms, and locked doors. This is especially true for your most important servers and other technology. The security risk assessment is required and it can also be very revealing. So your risk analysis is required by the HIPAA security rule and it is required to be done annually. This is where you conduct an accurate and thorough assessment of the potential risks and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of electronic protected health information held by your organization. There are tools at healthit.gov that can help with conducting the security risk assessment. There's actually a template and a format for the SRA. You're not alone. There's help out there. There's even training out there, including real life scenario for practice. Follow the link on this slide to play the Office of the National Coordinator Cybersecurity Game. It can be very revealing about what you know and don't know about privacy and security. Where does the data come from? The provenance of the data is the origin of clinical information or when it was first created. The origin can be a variety of places. It could be in the clinician's office. It could be in a lab. It could be from a wearable technology or from the patient's home. It could be their own glucose monitoring, their own blood pressure monitoring. Where was the clinical information when it was created? This is very important for us to know because we can now technically segment the data based on where it came from. If we can identify the provenance, we can provide that information to our clinician and we can segment the data accordingly so it can be used correctly when decisions need to be made. There is more information on data provenance in the reference slide at the end of this lecture. Determinants of trust related to provenance are where trust or the assurance for the data is based on what is believed or believable. Obviously, when we trust the data, it's traceable to a source of truth, so we know it was unaltered. We know what the original source was and we know what it said at the point that it was created. And, of course, trust is always based on whatever evidence we have about where the data was created and what has happened to the data since its time of creation. The Office of the National Coordinator has a standards and interoperability framework that is working on establishing trust in terms of data provenance. Currently, they are creating guidelines for establishing data provenance in our electronic health records content standards, including at which levels the provenance needs to be paid attention to or applied. They're establishing a set of provenance elements and vocabularies so that we're all speaking the same language about data provenance and trust and they're standardizing provenance so that it can be included in the interoperability that we are sharing. 
Again, there's a link to a website with more information about the SNI framework as the standards and interoperability framework is known. All links are listed in the reference slide at the end of this lecture. In relationship to trust and data provenance, what does the electronic health record system need to do? If it is a source system, the EHR needs to be able to create the data and maintain that data for the legally required time frame, which differs according to the provider type setting or geographical region. You need to be able to change or update the data if appropriate and legally allowed. You need to be able to assemble it in something that can be understandable by the decision makers, compose documents, compose messages, and then, obviously, export or transmit the data, sometimes with the provenance associated with it and sometimes not. The receiving system needs to be able to import or receive the data coming from the source system, disassemble it, and put it in the right places in the record so that it can be accessed and used for decision making, decompose messages if appropriate, and finally, maintain or retain the data for the time frame needed. Again, there is development of data provenance guidance. There, there are standards Again, there is development of data provenance guidance. There are standards. Again, there is development of data provenance guidance. There's a standards and interoperability framework tiger team. They are working with HL7, looking at the clinical document architecture and fast healthcare interoperability resources, or FHIR, really trying to answer three very important questions. Where did the data come from? Has it been changed? And can I trust it? Can I trust the data that I see in front of me? At the time of this recording, development and testing under the SNI framework was still ongoing. This concludes Lecture C, Cybersecurity of Unit 10, Ensuring the Security and Privacy of Information Shared. In summary, Interoperable systems require security, which requires cybersecurity and risk assessment. You must know what the risks are to your system and how to mitigate them. To be effective, interoperability is dependent upon both providers and patients trusting the data. The standards and processes for establishing this trust are under development. Thank you very much for your attention.